Today we're going to be ranking every single fight that happened in the Chunin exams, one of the most iconic arcs of the Naruto series. And bear in mind, we're just going to be ranking the fights that were actually proctored either in the preliminaries or in the finals of the Chunin exams, not every single fight that happened in the Forest of Death, for example, because that would be very messy and convoluted, so the 1v1 fights in the arena and the preliminaries are much easier to account for. Starting off with number 13, Tenten versus Temari. Now, if you've never read the manga, you'd be surprised with how quick this fight ends in the manga. They essentially skip through the entire thing and they only show the last panel of Ten Ten laying on Temari's fan, utterly defeated and a lot of weapons on the ground, but we don't see the actual fight. They do extend the fight in the anime, but it kind of feels boring and pointless because the fight doesn't really do much. I mean, it's just Ten Ten throwing a lot of tools towards Temari and she doesn't have to do anything to dodge at all, she just uses her wind. There was no higher purpose to the fight, the characters really didn't develop during the fight, there were no significant themes, so yeah, Kishimoto did the right thing and just skip over the fight completely and say, yeah, Tamari wins, she stomped Tenten, she's a powerful threat, be careful with her. Still, it doesn't make for the most compelling fight, though, I like how Kishimoto represents it in the manga, it's just really quick, and you get the feeling Tamari's pretty strong, because, oh, Tenten, she's in the team with Rock Lee and Neji, and they're both really hyped up now, she's probably powerful too, because they kind of respect her, but no, man, Tamari's much more powerful, It's a good thing because she's an antagonist in this arc and we should fear her as the audience but even still the fight wasn't exactly great but i don't have any complaints either when we talk about the manga fight the anime fight's just bad number 12 dosu versus choji this fight was also really quick but we actually see what happens in the fight itself in the manga as well as in the anime choji essentially rushes at dosu without thinking too much with his meatball jutsu and dosu waits for choji to hit the wall and then he uses is that moment when Choji's not gonna be spinning to touch him and infuse his body with those undulations of sound that's going to mess up the water inside of his body and therefore one-shotting Choji. Now, Dosu kind of had development during that fight because he was pissed with Orochimaru by the way he treated him and his teammates during the Chunin exam, so he kind of changed, but it didn't really go anywhere. He was stomped by Gara afterwards without much ceremony, and Choji certainly didn't have a lot of development in this fight. Yes, Asuma talked him into fighting because he was actually not really wanting to go down there and fight Dosu in the first place, but Asuma told him they would go to a steakhouse, so Choji fought him, and that was pretty much it. Choji was a very one-dimensional character before the Sasuke retrieval arc, if we're being honest. Though I like Dosu's strategy, he is a strategist at heart, and the way he defeated Choji was pretty clever, all things considered. Not a bad fight, but we also don't really care all that much about Dosu and Choji, so it was a good choice to to keep the fight sweet and short. Number 11, Kankuro versus Mizumi. Now, some people don't even remember who Mizumi is. He is the bendy guy that fought against Kankuro in the preliminaries of the Chunin exams. He kind of has powers that Luffy had in the One Piece series. And their fight was also pretty quick. I mean, we see that several of these fights are quick and Kishimoto doesn't want to linger too much on characters that we don't care all that much about. But this one, it's actually interesting how Kankuro manages to win because we first think that Mizumi bends himself around Kankuro and breaks his neck, but actually no, Kankuro was using a puppet to be himself the whole time, or was it a substitution? We just don't know. And then he used the puppet to pierce Mizumi instead and win the fight. It was quick, clever, and it got the job done. Also setting up Kankuro as a credible threat. Even though obviously Tamari and Kankuro were kind of overshadowed by Gaara in this arc, they should be threatening as well. Number 10, we have Sakura versus Ino, and a lot of people really really detest this fight, and it does get a bad rap, but it's not that bad, if we're being honest. The anime kind of extends this fight longer than it should have lasted, but it's a decent fight in the manga. It's pretty brutal, all things considered, it's just Sakura and Ino punching each other, using taijutsu to break each other's teeth, and people say, well, they're just fighting over Sasuke, it's so shallow. Well, yeah, it's kind of shallow, but then again, they are 12-year-old girls. Sakura and Ino, they have some interesting development in their friendship and in their overall relationship in this fight. Yes, Ino had to come in and save Sakura in the forest of death when they were being attacked by the sound team, and then Sakura cut her hair off. She had all that development because if you think about it, her hair was the most important thing that she had in that point of her life, and she chose to sacrifice that in order to save her friends. When Ino saw that and realized, well, I am not stepping up because I really care about my hair, 
hair and I have to catch up to Sakura, so she decides to cut her hair off as well in the fight against Sakura. And Sakura thinks, oh, this is just you being a little petty because I cut my hair, so you have to do it too to show that you're growing just like me. But actually, it was a little bit more clever than that because Ino imbued her hair with chakra to paralyze Sakura so that she could hit her mind transfer jutsu on Sakura and win the fight. And she does hit the mind transfer jutsu, it's just that Sakura's inner self punches Ino out of her consciousness, which is a pretty cool concept, I'm not gonna lie, I really liked inner Sakura, it's a shame Kishimoto doesn't really use her anymore in Naruto Shippuden, you kinda drop that. And honestly, that was my favorite part of Sakura's character, she was very funny when she had her inner self monologues completely contrasting or enhancing what she was actually portraying physically to the world and having the inner self come in and save the day. Yes, Sakura had Naruto's help for sure, that really helped her out, but it was Sakura's inner self that eventually broke her free of Ino's jutsu. The one bad thing I see about this fight is that it tied, so it feels a little lackluster and kind of a cop-out. Oh no, they tied, there's no winner, what a boring conclusion. I guess Kishimoto had plans to develop their rivalry further in the future of the story, but never really got to it, so he thought having them tie here would be something more interesting because then there would be a victor in the eventual resolution of their rivalry. Even though they kind of start to understand and respect each other after this fight, they go back to their rivalry ways. But this fight's certainly not as bad as people make it out to be. It's not great though. Number 9, Shikamaru versus Ken. This fight is not terribly remarkable, but it's the first time we see Shikamaru being pretty intelligent. Albeit the strategy he uses against Ken is not nearly as elaborate or clever as the strategies he uses against Himari and Tayuya, for example. It's a first step to Shikamaru's greatness. And it's just kind of fun to watch Shikamaru fight. He's always bored, he doesn't really want to be there, and he gets annoyed when he has to fight against a girl. It's the old conundrum, right? If you lose, you lost to a girl. If you win, you beat a girl up. And it's kind of funny to see Shikamaru going through those paces. Then again, the strategy he uses, he just kind of uses his shadow possession to knock Kin's head against the wall. And yeah, it, there's a little bit of misdirection with the shuriken Shikamaru was about to toss before the end of the fight, but he didn't really have to toss the shuriken, right? He just did the dodging for theatrics. He could have literally just ran against the wall and released the paralysis jutsu and hit Kin's head against the wall. But it was still an interesting fight to see. It's a shame that, I mean, Ken is pretty much done with the story after this fight. We just see her corpse afterwards when we find out Orochimaru used Ken and Zaku for the sacrifices for the Edo Tensei Jutsu. Man, for being honest, the entire sound team was kind of a waste of potential, but anyways. Fight number eight is gonna be Sasuke Uchiha versus Yoroi. The guy that could absorb ninjutsu before absorbing ninjutsu was cool. If you think about it, Yoroi was the first person in the Naruto-verse, at least when we see in the order of release, to be able to absorb ninjutsu, which is something that became extremely common afterwards in the end of the Naruto series and also in the Boruto series. I mean, the Boruto series, everybody can absorb ninjutsu or negate it somehow. But Yoroi, he didn't actually absorb ninjutsu itself. He was able to drain chakra upon touching, so definitely not as OP as the Preta path, for example. Still a very problematic opponent for you to fight. He could steal your chakra and Sasuke barely had any chakra when he was fighting against Yoroi there. He was nerfed by the curse mark Orochimaru had just put in him. And because the curse mark was essentially exposed, there was no ceiling that Kakashi would eventually do, then if Sasuke used any of his chakra, then the curse mark would flare and paralyze his movement. Well, there's a fine line between the curse mark amping him greatly, just like it did in the Forest of Death, to it paralyzing him and making him unable to do anything. And the problem is that because Sasuke couldn't really recover his chakra due to the curse mark affecting him, then he couldn't really use his chakra to control the curse mark properly. And that's what caused the paralysis. When Sasuke ran out of chakra, then his own chakra wouldn't be able to suppress the power of the curse mark and he would be overwhelmed by it. Meaning that, yes, if Sasuke still has chakra, using the curse mark will make him more powerful. Yes, it will also distort his personality and pretty much destroy his body from inside out, but it will grant him a lot of power. We saw Sasuke literally dodging a blast with a speed of sound casually against Haku, but in the Yoroi fight, that was an entirely different situation. Sasuke, first of all, couldn't use his Sharingan. Kakashi literally told him, if you use your Sharingan during the fight, I'm gonna step in and stop it, because if you use it, you're gonna die. The 
curse mark's gonna override your body and it's not gonna be pretty. So he couldn't use the Sharingan and any other ninjutsu for that matter. He had to solely rely on Taijutsu without the Sharingan. And Yoroi is like a grown man trained by Orochimaru with a nasty power that's the worst possible combination for Sasuke being out of chakra in this situation. The fight itself is pretty brief too, but it is tense because, oh man, Sasuke is really nerfed. He's really thrown against the wall here. And the way he manages to win is very satisfactory. Sasuke copied Rock Lee's jutsu that he used against Sasuke before the first round of the Chunin exams, and it was the initial stages of the primary lotus, kicking the guy up and shadowing him from behind midair. Then again, Lee didn't get to finish his primary lotus on Sasuke, so Sasuke invented his own attack after using Rock Lee's move to throw him up in the air, and that's when he came up with a lion barrage. A pretty cool jutsu to end the fight with, it's not very usual that we see a taijutsu attack ending a fight, if we're being honest. But the best moment of this fight is when Sasuke manages to get the curse mark under control, even though he was out of chakra through sheer willpower. So yeah, this fight's pretty cool, it's short, but it's nice. Number 7 is gonna be Shino versus Zaku. This fight's cool. It's kind of used as a backdrop to Kakashi and Orochimaru's confrontation when Orochimaru comes in and tries to get Sasuke while Kakashi is sealing his curse mark and then Orochimaru threatens Kakashi, Kakashi threatens Orochimaru back and then Kakashi kinda soils his pants because he's afraid of Orochimaru and stuff. But the Shino versus Zaku fight is used to illustrate Orochimaru's point to Kakashi that he doesn't really care about his lower pawns, he's just going to discard them without any care for their well-being and that's exactly what happens. Shino stomps the guy, Shino was ruthless in Naruto part 1 man, they did Shino so dirty in Naruto Shippuden. Now, he wasn't evil or anything but he was ruthless, cold and calculating. When the fight starts we think Zaku's nerfed because Sasuke broke his arms during the forest of death but turns out the damage wasn't that significant so Zaku first unleashes one of his arms and then Shino says well but I can attack you from both sides, my insects will come from behind and I'll come from the front, you have to choose between one of us. And then Zaku says what about that and then turns out his second arm was also capable and Zaku uses his blast and explodes his arms. Well, actually we don't see that in the anime, but in the manga, the scene when Zaku explodes his arms is very gruesome because one of the arms literally blasts out of his body and it's dismembered. <laughs> yeah, it turns out Shino had clogged the holes of Zaku's arms, both of them. Even though Zaku was pretending they were both hurt, Shino was like, yeah, I'm not gonna take any chances and it's from my nature and the nature of the Aburame clan not to underestimate any opponent. Just a nice fight setting up Shino's character and also every time the characters talked about Shino, even Neji when he uses his Byakugan to peer into Shino's body, he's like, this guy's not human. I like those types of things. They build up the character to this epic proportion that Shino doesn't really get a payoff, unfortunately, because in Naruto Shippuden he turns into a Joe character and it's very unfortunate. Number six, we have Naruto versus Neji in the finals of the Chunyi exams. Now this fight is pretty cool. We get to see Naruto using his Shadow and Clone Jutsu and Neji disposing of them with his gentle fist. We see the 64 palms for the first time, which is a really cool looking design for a Jutsu. And the themes behind Naruto fighting against this destiny that Neji wants to impose against him are nice as well. The only problem with this fight is that the framing of the theming isn't exactly great because in hindsight, turns out Neji was kind of right. And the point of the fight was to prove Neji wrong. Naruto had to prove his destiny wasn't set for him and neither was Neji's. Because Neji thought he would never be free from the clutches of the main family of the Hyuga clan and he thought Naruto would never be anyone because he's a loser. Fated to be a nobody for the rest of his life. And that was his destiny. But Neji just didn't know that Naruto was the son of the most talented shinobi ever born in the Leaf Village. The literal reincarnation of a demigod and possessed the strongest chakra creature on the planet. He just missed three small facts to make up his destiny thing in there and yeah it turns out retroactively speaking Naruto was kind of wrong and Neji was right because yeah Naruto became the Hokage, he saved the world, he did all those great things while Neji sacrificed himself to save Hinata, a member of the main family just like his dad did in the past. There's this point that Neji makes that yes it was his choice 
to save Hinata. But even still, it seems like you were destined to save the main family by sacrificing your life, doesn't it? It would be more interesting if they approached the situation a little bit differently, if they tweaked Neji's philosophy ever so slightly. It could still have something to do with destiny, but he shouldn't focus on Naruto being destined to be a loser, but destined to be cursed by the power that he had inside of him, the Nine Tails, something that was wrong, that people would never accept him, and that power would eventually consume him, so that, yeah, Naruto could actually prove him wrong. Because the Nine Tails was definitely a curse for Naruto. Being the son of the fourth Hokage and having all those powers doesn't really make you a weak candidate for being a great ninja. So, in that regard, Neji was correct, but he would be wrong if he assumed Naruto would be fated to be an evil person and do terrible things because of the Nine Tails inside of him, for example. So then, eventually, Neji would be proved wrong after the fight. Yes, Naruto makes his point during the fight, but he kind of gaslights Neji as things stand. So this is why this fight's not ranked higher up, because the fight looks good, the choreography's nice, Kishimoto does a great job with the fight itself. The flashbacks in the anime during the fight are a little lengthy, but they're much better in the manga as per usual. And some people may say that Naruto being able to shrug off a 64 palm direct hit with the Nine Tails' his chakra is, you know, a little bit of a reach, but I can accept that the Nine Tails is extremely powerful. Naruto literally trained to acquire the power of the Nine Tails during the period they had to train before the final round. And it was also nice to see Naruto fighting with the chakra of the Nine Tails for the first time on his own volition. But because of the theming of the fights, it will not rank higher than number six. Number five is going to be Naruto versus Kiba. Now, this fight is actually pretty cool. It shows Naruto is not dumb, as many people think. He strategizes in this fight. He uses the transformation jutsu to fool Kiba into punching a Kamaru's face. And Naruto also shows his classic determination never to give up in a fight. It's pretty good. The Fang over Fang versus Shadow Clone Jutsu is interesting to watch. And yeah, Kiba can be a little bit insufferable, but it's whatever. A lot of people don't like this fight because of how Naruto wins. Not the combo that he lands on Kiba, but the fart more specifically. Yes, it is done as a joke, but it makes sense if you think about it. Kiba has a very heightened sense of smell, so trying to disrupt that is a very valid tactic. Now, Naruto didn't exactly mean to fart on Kiba's face, and the way Kiba approached Naruto from behind, kinda, you know, lowering his head right next to Naruto's butt was a little bit weird, but it was just very funny. I kinda like that moment, to be honest. And yeah, I'm fine with fights ending in a more comedic way once in a while. Number four, we have Hinata versus Neji. This fight's actually pretty good. It's definitely the greatest highlight for Hinata's character in the entire series. I would even argue it's a much greater moment than the moment she had against Pain and Naruto Shippuden because at least the Neji fight made something out of Hinata's character because after she confessed her love for Naruto and essentially got herself killed trying to save him against Pain, Naruto didn't even acknowledge what she did and nothing really came from her Hinata sacrifice. At least the fight against Neji really showed Hinata's guts and that she was really trying to emulate Naruto the way she respected him, so much so that she almost got herself killed in that fight, and even said that her ninja way is not to give up, just like Naruto's. It's a very cool moment, but one of those difficult fights to watch because, yeah, everybody knows Hinata's gonna lose, and it's gonna be painful, but she's still trying her very best to win because Naruto's watching, and he doesn't want her to fail, and Hinata cannot fail. She has to fight against everything. She is a person that doesn't really like fighting. It's very obvious that Hinata doesn't like violence, but still, it's what she has to do. And the entire history between her and Neji, the way Neji's dad died to save Hinata in the past, even though it should have been Hinata's dad, it brings a lot of resentment into the fight, so much so that Neji literally tried to kill Hinata in the end, and three Jonins and a special Jonin had to come in and stop Neji from doing so in a really cool shot when they all stop him, holding him in different places. So this is a pretty cool fight. Number three. Sasuke Uchiha versus Gara in the final round of the tuning exams. Now, the first thing about this fight is just the sheer anticipation we had about it. Ever since we saw Sasuke was about to fight Gara, this guy that was hyped up to be the incarnation of death in the Naruto universe, we were stoked. Because Sasuke is one of the main characters and he has a way of fighting that is always very entertaining to watch. So we were excited to see what Sasuke was about to do. And the interesting thing about that is that we didn't see what Sasuke was doing during 
during the training period between the preliminaries and the final round. So, like, what was Sasuke about to learn to fight against Garo? We know Kakashi was training him, but what was happening there? The anticipation in universe made the reader feel very excited and also to anticipate this fight because everybody was talking about Sasuke versus Garo when they were in the arena and stuff like that. I want to see the Uchiha fight. And then they were delaying the fight because Sasuke was late and he was late. And then people were starting to wonder, wait, did Sasuke die or anything because Orochimaru was after him? Raido comes to Hiruzen at a certain point and says that the Anbu couldn't track Sasuke down because they were looking for him. And Hiruzen says, well, we're gonna have to disqualify Sasuke. And everybody's like, wait, Sasuke just died and we don't know about it? That's an amazing way to build anticipation and suspense. And then Orochimaru disguised as the Kazekage tells Hiruzen, no, no, bro, I really want to see that Uchiha kid fight. Do not disqualify him. Do me a solid here. And Hiruzen doesn't disqualify Sasuke, which is good. And then Sasuke arrives at the cusp of him being... Actually, he passed a couple of seconds after he should have been eliminated, but he does arrive with Kakashi and the leaves floating around him. It's a really cool shot. And we see Sasuke's new design for the second round of the Chunin exams. Like, he's the only character that got a redesign for the final round of the Chunin exams. And I don't know about you guys, but I love the dark outfit of the Chunin exams with that bandage sleeve on his left arm because of the Chidori training and all that with a slightly longer hair. Especially in the manga, you see a difference between Sasuke's hair when he has his blue outfit and his black outfit because obviously that month passed and Sasuke's hair grew. And Kishimoto just thought, yeah, I'm just gonna make Sasuke even cooler now. And obviously he did a redesign for Sasuke because he was the character that was being anticipated to arrive during the entire arena sequence. With all those fights going on, we were just like, where's Sasuke? Is he gonna really fight Gara? And then the anticipation was killing everybody. And then when Sasuke arrives with a new outfit, that's pretty great. And the fight itself against Gara is also cool. First, because before the fight even starts, Naruto and Shikamaru witness Gara just absolutely destroying two guys that were trying to hustle him so that he would throw the fight of Sasuke and that their feudal lord would win a bet. And yeah, we get it. Gara is extremely intimidating and he likes to destroy people very very much but seeing it done so shortly before the fight makes us fear for Sasuke and Naruto is like dude Sasuke's gonna die I have to warn Kakashi he has to stop this fight but Sasuke is actually doing pretty good he copies Rock Lee's jutsu and he's able to run as fast as Rock Lee without his weight on because of that he manages to press Gara a lot it's really cool to see his taijutsu combos against Gara but that's not the highlights of the fight obviously not because Sasuke uses his Chidori for the first time. After Gara encases himself in an orb of sand, once he understands Sasuke is kind of destroying him in Taijutsu and he has to protect himself from all sides, then Sasuke doesn't have another option. He has to charge his Chidori to pierce through Gara's shield. And the Chidori is probably my favorite Jutsu in the Naruto series. The first time it's used, well, it couldn't have been done better. There was an entire chapter that revolved around the first usage of the Chidori in that fight, and it's called the reason why he was late and playing that yeah Sasuke had to train to learn the Chidori up until like midway through the final round because it's such a difficult jutsu to master and the way Sasuke climbs up the arena wall charges the Chidori cracks the wall piercing with the Chidori then lands on the ground and dashes at Gara, landing it on the sand orb and then actually hurting Gara for the very first time in his life is very climactic those are two characters that kind of share a similar bond they want to kill other people. Now Sasuke wants to kill a specific person because of what he did to his clan and Gara wants to kill others to feel alive and that's why when Gara tracks Sasuke down and he was training with Kakashi and all that he says we have the same eyes. Vengeance, destruction, they permeate our eyes. It's just very nice and a great fight. The only problem with this fight as it stands because we're just kind of counting the fights that are proctored is that this fight doesn't really end in the arena itself. It's taken into the forest after the Konoha Crush invasion starts. So for the incomplete fight, I'll give it number three. But it would probably be higher than that if we counted the entire thing because Gara versus Sasuke in the forest itself is even better than the arena fight. It's amazing. Especially the part of the fight where Sasuke has to fight off against the curse mark using a third Chidori which he wasn't supposed to. The shot when he ignites his curse mark as he's holding the Chidori and then you see he managed to hurt Gara is 
one of the best shots in the Naruto series. But moving on to number two, we have Shikamaru versus Temari. This fight's just cool. It doesn't really have a lot of meaning to the plot itself. Like, sure, it's two characters fighting, but they're just fighting for the exams themselves. But even still, the way Shikamaru strategizes in this fight is kind of nuts. Using that three-layered strategy, starting off with a growing shadow because the sun is setting behind him, using the wall of the arena to actually extend his shadows further and trying to catch Temari of guard, but actually directing her to the location of the whole Naruto made on the ground, then using his coat with a kunai tied up to create another shadow further beyond and extend his own shadow further, and then finally catching Temari with the whole Naruto made on the ground that Shikamaru used to extend his shadow and finally catch Temari from behind. It's the first time we see Shikamaru actually flexing his brain a bit, and the entire fight is pretty comedic too, like Shikamaru, he doesn't want to be there, he's like lying down once Naruto throws him into the arena, and obviously Shikamaru has to fight another girl, but the, the interesting thing about this fight is that it starts to set up the romance between these two characters. Tamari starts to respect Shikamaru, and I have to say, Shikamaru and Tamari is by far the best pairing that we have in the Naruto series, at least for characters that end up together during the story and that didn't start the story already together. So starting to see the relationship blossoming here in a fight is pretty interesting, and the way it ends is also hilarious. Shikamaru gives up and Choji knew he was gonna do that. Tamari gets a little upset, like, what the hell are you doing? You beat me! And then Shikamaru's just, I don't have enough chakra. Let me go take a nap. Pretty cool fight, I have to say. And number one, the best fights of the tuning exams is going to be Hikaku Uchiha versus Toka Senju. Nah, it's gonna be Gara versus Rock Lee. I mean, I don't think anybody's really going to disagree with me in the number one position. Maybe some people will disagree, but at least these people will understand why I put it here. For a sizable portion of the Naruto fandom, this is their favorite fight, not just in the Chunyi exams, but in the entire series, and for very good reason. First, because we learn to care about for Rock Lee during the Forest of Death, because Rock Lee's protecting Sakura and therefore Naruto and Sasuke as well. He's just a good-hearted kid. And before the fight even starts, we want to see him win. We also see Gara absolutely turning people into mush in the Forest of Death and acting like a psychopath, so we want him to lose. So I would even say that even for first-time watchers, this is the fight you're probably most invested in in the preliminaries. Even though Naruto and Sasuke fight in the preliminaries as well, I would say this fight you care more about because it's between two important characters because let's be real, Kiba not exactly great against Naruto, and Yori, we didn't even know who Yori was fighting Sasuke, and that fight was pretty quick, but this fight, well, this fight is important, and it does not disappoint. During this fight, we see that these two characters couldn't be more different from each other. Rock Lee, a guy that had to work the hardest, he was cursed with not being able to use ninjutsu or genjutsu, but he still wanted to prove himself a great shinobi, so he had to train hard, really damn hard, to learn taijutsu and have a chance to be a good ninja. While Gara never trained, he was born with innate abilities, and they were enough to make him much more powerful than most ninjas in the world. It's so iconic to see Rock Lee sweating blood trying to punch Gara while his sand just protects him automatically while Gara crosses his arms and does nothing. But obviously the contrast is much more interesting when there's a variance in who's winning the fight, because one of the most iconic scenes in the entire series is when Rock Lee decides to remove his weights when he tosses them down, they essentially create two craters on the arena grounds, and everybody is shocked, including the audience. I mean, the guy wasn't shocked because he knew what was going to happen, but then Rock Lee gets much faster and he starts to punch Gara. This is Rock Lee getting the upper hand because he was losing the fight before it, so this variation, this fluctuation of who's winning and just not knowing what's going to happen next makes for a very exciting fight. Rock Lee uses his primary lotus and it doesn't work because Gara uses substitution jutsu, and then after that, Gara gets gets the upper hand because Rock Lee can barely move. His muscles were ripped using the first inner gates and he's slower now, he can barely fight. And then we get that heart-wrenching flashback where we see Rock Lee's past, what he had to go through, the training regiment and Guy taking him under his wing and teaching him the Lotus. And that's where he gets his strength to use the hidden Lotus, opening all the way up until the fifth gate. And that scene is just amazing all the way through, like him opening 
opening the gates and then blitzing Gara from all sides, eventually landing that final blow. Absolutely amazing. And everybody's shocked with Lee's performance that nobody was expecting that type of thing. Unfortunately for him, Gara survives the Hidden Lotus and destroys his arms using his sand. And this is one of the harshest moments in the series, I would say. After seeing everything Lee went through to win this fight and still lose in such a brutal fashion is heartbreaking. And that's one of the reasons why this fight is great and so well remembered. The fact that Rock Lee stood up and remained at a fighting stance after having an arm and a leg destroyed by Gara Sand and also being literally unconscious speaks volumes of his will not to give up and to continue his pursuit of becoming a great ninja, which is heartbreaking because guys like, you don't have to do it anymore. You've already proven you're a great shinobi while he cries and hugs Lee. It's one of the saddest scenes in the series. And it's very definitive proof that, no, the theme of the Naruto series is not hard work beats natural talent because obviously hard work lost here. But that was not the point of the fight. The point was that Rock Lee was clinging to his humanity, trying to better himself, trying to become a ninja, while Gara he gave up that humanity, he just wanted to kill. It was this insane contrast and the entire different philosophies those two characters had that made this fight even greater. This fight is also going to be important for Gara himself later because he remembers Guy protecting Lee as he was about to kill him and that will prompt Gara to actually think about his actions a little bit and that people still want to protect each other. That he is not alone and this fact comes up a lot. He remembers Yashimaru, he remembers that when Naruto is using his Takna Jutsu on him. So this fight has a lot of meaning and repercussion and just a lot of consequences overall for the Naruto series. And it's the reason why it's one of the greatest fights in the series overall. Subscribe to this channel if you haven't done so already. Like this video as well to help me out with the YouTube algorithm. And watch this other cool video right here for more Naruto content. Thank you so much for watching.